Let's see how we can extend the intuition we developed for discrete time convolution to what's called the continuous time convolution and the Dirac delta function. So in the discrete case, we have a function x of t, something like this. So we have discrete values of x, which I can draw in terms of this graph such as that. But in the continuous case, we're going to have a value of x of t. So this is t, and on the y-axis is x of t. And in the, in the continuous case, we're going to have some arbitrary function of time. Now, earlier we picked one value of over here using the delta. So if this was the value k, this could be represented as delta t minus k. And that allowed us to pick out this value. So x of t is given by x of k times delta t minus k. And we can think of this something like um, the value of the delta function is, has the strength of x of k uh, at, that, at that point. So uh, I should be careful over here. It's not x of t over here, uh, x of t, x of k. x of k is given by x of k multiplied by delta t minus k. Okay, now let's see whether we can generalize this intuition to here. What we need, just take the delta function, which is, uh, which is, which is defined in, for just one value. So recall that delta in the discrete case is given by delta of t equals 1. If t equals 0, it's going to be 0 otherwise. But here, what we want is something that picks out just one teeny tiny point over here, and uh, that makes it sort of harder to define because picking one point is going to be uh, something that's discontinuous. And so what we do instead is we start with the following function. We have a function which is defined like this. It has a support of width uh, t, and its height is 1 over t. So in other words, the, this is a function which has a width of t and a height of 1 over t, and let's say that value is 0, so it's defined on both sides of the, uh, of the x-axis, on the positive and the negative sides. And we take the limit as t tends to 0. In other words, we're going to squeeze this on both sides, and as we squeeze it, the rectangle is going to get taller and taller, so we get taller and taller rectangles like that, and even taller like that. But the area, which is t times 1 over t, is going to be 1. And so in the limit, we represent this by a, something like this. It's like an arrow pointed at, one, at 0. And this has a, uh, still has an area of 1 but has a support of 0, support of 0, and uh, has a height of infinity, actually. Height equals infinity. So this is a pretty weird function. It's called, and uh, it was defined by the physicist Dirac, so it's also called the Dirac delta, Dirac delta function. And more precisely, we define it like this, integral from minus infinity to infinity of delta t uh, dt equals 1. So what we're saying is that the mass, uh, the area under the curve of delta t is 1, and the delta t equals 0 for all t not equal to 0, and the delta t at 0 is undefined. So we don't know what it is. So. Uh, I'm not going to go through a more formal definition because this is mathematically somewhat complicated, but we'll just define it in this particular way, and this is the Dirac delta function. But that gives us enough for us, building on the intuition in the discrete case, for us to define the, uh, uh, to use this for, for defining the continuous time convolution function. So let's start as before. So remember we had the selector, so instead we'll say something like this. xt multiplied by delta t is going to be nothing more than x0 delta t. And why? That's because, just as we saw over here in the discrete case, xk is xk multiplied by delta t minus k. So 
over here when you know, we're talking about uh, t equals this value over here is the value of x at zero and so we're saying when you multiply x t by delta t we really can ignore everything uh, except the value at x zero and that's why we get this value over here let's forget this equation over here because we don't really care what uh, x, uh, what value x has other than a t equals zero, so we just care about t zero because that's what the delta t is doing, it's acting as selector. Alternatively, we can think of x zero as uh, multiplying the, 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 the unit value of delta uh, by its strength. So delta t sort of selects the value of x zero. And similarly, we can see that uh, x t, when you multiply it with the selector function which is moved to the right by tau is given by x tau delta t minus tau. Again this is because the uh, selector function has no value other than at t equals tau and uh, at that point it's going to take the value it, it's going to give you one and or a mass of one and then you multiply that with the value of x at that point over here and so uh, we can therefore say that xt then is this given by putting together all these little slices, integral from minus infinity to infinity, x tau delta t minus tau d tau. And that is uh, basically putting back together xt from its slices, but each slice is obtained by using the delta function or the time shifted delta function over here. And notice that this is integrated with respect to tau over here. And more generally, we can say that xt convolved with yt is given by the integral, integral minus infinity to infinity, x tau y t minus tau delta, sorry, d tau. Uh, d tau. And this defines the convolution of two functions. And again, what you see over here is that if we define zt to be the convolution of two functions xt and yt, xt convolved with yt, then zt is given by this integral minus integral minus infinity to infinity x tau yt minus tau d tau. And the first thing is, so for each value of t, for each value of t over here, to compute uh, zt, we need to uh, compute an integral. And also note the presence of this helper variable, this additional variable, delta to the tau. And we'll see that this kind of helper is going to show up all the time when we start looking at uh, transform domains, where we'll introduce an additional helper variable for us to get what we want. So. Uh, all this is just to give you a kind of intuitive sense of what does a convolution function mean, why does it look this way, and uh, we're going to use this convolution function when we start analyzing uh, systems, uh, signals and systems. And uh, so next we're going to look at signals, which we haven't looked at so far.